This episode is brought to you by Raycon. As ever more jobs can be done with automated assistance or even entirely by robots, are we approaching a time when most people won't have a job? And if so, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Ever since we first started making label-saving devices, even before the term robot started appearing in sci-fi around a century ago, people's opinions have been mixed on whether more automation is a good thing or not, or if it is going to result in either humanity being reduced to being automatons themselves, unable to feed their families because they can't compete with the robots, or result in us being slaughtered by runaway robots, oppressed by a minority with control over robots, or going the other direction with us being put into a utopia in which everyone is a lazy hedonistic slug whose every whim is tended to by robots, or freed from drudgery and the fears of basic survival to turn our eyes to grander goals and prizes. Today we are going to discuss these options and ask how probable each is and what we can do to prevent an option or encourage it, mitigate it, or just control it to a good end and we need to start by acknowledging that none of those concerns can be casually dismissed as unlikely, but nor should we be convinced that they are inevitable, or even where they might occur, or assume they can't be walked back or their impact cushioned if they start heading in a direction deemed undesirable in some ways. As with a lot of our topics, we won't be able to say definitively that A or B will occur, much remains unpredictable and also depends a lot on the character of humanity going forward. I tend to be more positive about that in general so it makes me more optimistic about the future and how we'll handle some of these tests of character, but I aim for realism first and foremost and realistically this is a problem for humanity going forward. We might as well start with asking if more automation is a good thing in and of itself. There are obviously a lot of pros to having advanced technology, but the major con is the fear that it contains the seeds of our own destruction, and again there are several paths for that. We might see a small group own everything, including ultra-loyal killer robots to do their oppressing, or maybe we create a disloyal and hostile super-intelligent machine, or wreck our planet with our weapons or waste, or simply poison our character by making life too easy. But all of those scenarios have to do with misusing that technology or lacking sufficient mastery of it. Reckless use is the danger rather than the technology being inherently bad, and that's why we're here today to help anticipate and contemplate those problems and prepare to avoid or handle them. Is more automation good? Yes. It lets us feed more people with less work, to make clothes and houses for them with less work. It means we don't have to decide between pushing out an old or sick family member into the winter cold or watching the whole family starve. It makes it possible for us to have children spend over a decade in school and play rather than being out in the fields with their parents plowing and sowing. One might argue more time working as kids would benefit them too, but automation gives us the option and it gives us the abundance by being a labor amplifier. Note that I say labor amplifier rather than replacement. Classic sci-fi was very fixated on the idea of a computer of roughly human intellect stuffed into a humanoid robot body, or an android. Technically that's a man-shaped body, and a female-shaped one is called a gynoid, but android is generally considered non-gender specific these days. The android needed to be human small to do most tasks and most importantly, to take instructions, something a young child or animal cannot so presumably implies a need for a powerful robot brain. As time has rolled on and we got better at things, we realized we didn't need a human smart android that we could explain how to run our vacuums or broom to, we just make a dumb as dirt dedicated robot vacuum instead. And in other things, we take the smart human and teach them how to control the dumb machine, instead of making a smart machine. That humanoid robot in mind and body can be enslaved, and raise that fear of us letting ourselves fail ethically again in that way, and creating an entire new species of androids or genetically engineered people who are obedient and disposable, or not quite obedient enough and cut all of our throats in the middle of the night, or replacing us in broad daylight and peacefully with everyone around being fine with it. 
As I was getting ready to write the script, I was working on a DIY project with my wife and our youngest brother Caleb was helping, and at 15 he's already 6 foot, broad shouldered and a workhorse. I was unloading lumber and measuring and marking it, he was cutting and stacking, and being about to turn 42 I probably should not have tried to keep up the pace, but I did, and today I'm thankful ibuprofen and Icy Hot exist. I'm hardly alone in having done something like that, it's proverbial that the leading cause of death and injury in men over 40 is forgetting they're not 20 anymore, and subconscious motivations can range from hierarchy and status concerns to not being seen as weak, and trying to set a good example. We also have a fear of being obsolete or being replaced by a newer, stronger, smarter, and better looking model. I don't think most of us would be quite as worried about that when a robot doesn't look vaguely human or even act like one. We do have legitimate reason to fear automation and artificial intelligence, but we have lots of bad reasons too, and we want to separate those out and also make sure not to pursue pathways that leverage those fears and bad reasons. So the key to avoiding getting slaughtered by your own creations is to avoid making them mentally capable enough to rebel. We're not really worried about our horses or oxen or car engines betraying us. It also fits in with minimizing irrational fears of automation too. Let's get to some of those more rational fears though, and we'll contemplate the automated society as we examine those. Automation causes unemployment. This is a tricky one because people tend to say, that's not true, but it is completely true. Make a widget that lets five people do a job that used to take six, and someone is without that sixth job. You can also replace an entire piece of production or function chain with a machine, No more need for human phone operators patching your calls through or looking up a phone number for you. Now we can add caveats, first we rarely automate an entire process and have no real reason to, and for many reasons too but principally I'd say because it's strategically unwise, be it in war, business, or politics, to leave any chain without a human mind in it, or it's equal or superior, because you have competition who will find a way to exploit something subhuman and entirely automated. A billionaire who decides to totally automate his factory and relax with no employees to pay, who just rakes in the cash whilst relaxing on the beach, is going to wake up broke one morning. Someone is going to decide to exploit that lack of supervision and lack of active strategy. This is often how a family business founded by some workaholic can decay in future generations, they're just not as committed to it as Grandpa was, so to speak, preferring a different career or to idle in their wealth or just focus less on the business and more on being with their kids. Second, when we remove a job we generally find some new ones, and since that automation of the previous job made the entire human civilization a little more productive overall, that new job, on average, compared to the old job, on average, is a bit better pay for a bit less work, or more pleasant work or less monotonous work, less dangerous work, or work that doesn't cause subtle damage to the human over time, such as repetitive strain injury, deafness, back pain, etc., which might be as important as if you like your job and probably factors into if you do. Folks who actually like their jobs are generally more productive at it anyway, but also do not need as much stress relief for a job they don't like and typically don't have as many other issues with life. It's generally our goal to create a world where people like their jobs, and are more than able to support the basic needs and reasonable comforts of themselves and their family by doing them. Personally, I have zero interest in producing a world where people don't need to work at all. I would not view that as either a desirable or plausible objective. Something intelligent has to be making sure things get done and proving them against tampering by other intelligences. I also would not want to be reliant on its goodwill for my continued existence, especially if my relationship with it was essentially parasitical, which is definitely a conclusion that could be reached by a super intelligent AI whom we had all come to trust in and rely on for our continued well-being. Any drain on its time or resources, however small, would count, and only an infinite being could indefinitely tolerate mutuals, so to speak. And our universe appears to be finite. I also tend to suspect a prosperous humanity with magnificent automation is going to find it a lot easier to say no to creating intelligent artificial minds as slaves, even if the machine is created to like its job. I hate to say it this way, but sometimes prosperity makes it easier to find and afford scruples. And with all those resources and free time on their hands, there are bound to be plenty of people who are willing to get militant about the matter, 
especially given that we only need human level intelligence for maybe a tiny fraction of our actual production. So you're pushing AI abolition with the downside of people maybe needing to work an hour a week and generally to have trained their minds. I really have difficulty seeing that push failing, except insofar as I doubt it would ever be needed. I think people will be very opposed to human level AI being in any ways mass produced for at least many centuries to come. In the meantime, you have a hyper automated society already because again, you really don't need much brains for most of what we do, not when we turn a lot of brains to figuring out the specifics of a task like vacuuming a floor, and yet I do expect people to be busy because I think brain requiring tasks are a lot like all the new jobs we have from automation, things that will just keep emerging as folks have more time and mental energy to turn to things they couldn't before. Boredom is a thing people tend to experience when they have free time and can't do the things they want to be doing, for me I experience that when stuck in a doctor's waiting room or similar, and smartphones help a lot with that. I'm not really sure what free time with nothing to do would actually be like, I always have stuff to do, of varying priorities and including recreation, and I'm assuming that most people are all the same. When you're younger that sometimes is not the case. A lot of your options for doing things are curtailed by limited resources, mobility, and involvement, or if you freshly move to an area, especially pre-internet days when you don't know anyone and are a little hesitant to meet them and most of your stuff is still in route or packed up. Generally as the years roll on you drop roots and pick up interests, hobbies, friends, community involvement, and so on until you become an accomplished juggler. You've experienced a lot of life and have a lot of life going on as a result, and have an overflowing list of things you want to get done, and I really wouldn't ever see that changing just because you didn't have a typical job you worked 9 to 5 at. People are going to fill their days up with stuff, most retirees do so in short order, automation just makes it easier to fill up with things of your choosing, and without needing to work hard just to keep the lights on and heat in your house and the fridge full. I honestly don't see the 4 hour work week though, and more specifically I don't see the single job concept sticking around. I would expect folks to have a few different things they did for a living instead of just one, but that one is more of a hunch. Truthfully, single task jobs never really existed outside of factories and were rare there too. My guess is there will probably be fewer bosses and supervisors and a lot more automated coordination. As an example, one of our goals is to make sure there is work for everyone, and work that is compatible with their other obligations and is emotionally and materially rewarding. We think of automation as mostly being in terms of factories and we often forget that a lot of it is in the office and white collar jobs. The first job computers replaced were computers, that used to be a human job title, and so much of it is about finding opportunities and connecting people to them. We see a lot of that moving forward just in this decade when we start seeing all the equivalents of Uber, Grubhub, and Airbnb start emerging in different sectors, where people mostly work for themselves. Someone is eventually going to figure out how to make a daycare and babysitting version of those for instance, and if they pull off a good feeling of comfort and security for folks involved, its designer is going to be a billionaire, and it's going to add a big supplemental income to a lot of households while probably reducing costs for others. I have a suspicion that such a comfort level might only be achievable if people were putting cameras on their kids, but to be honest, I would be rather surprised if that didn't become normal inside the next couple decades anyway. As a follow up prediction, much as body cams are increasingly the norm for law enforcement, expect to see them on teachers or cameras in the classrooms and daycares that parents can access. That's a big chunk of automation too. Algorithms able to pour through data to either communicate a need specifically between two entities, I need a ride and this person is the nearest available, and to pour through recordings of people and pick out important bits, hypothetical abuse or other crimes, but also more mundane stuff like watching kids to see what they find boring or interesting to help tailor their personal education, or to help find habits we want to encourage or discourage early as they form. Also something bots are good at, able to sift through videos and pictures online to find every mention of you, every photo and video, and flag it. Since we brought up this privacy concern in all of this, I would also speculate that our answer to such things is going to be every public platform having auto ID built into everything, so that you are just automatically blurred or redacted from any post you didn't okay, photo, video, or audio, and probably any text references to you too. 
That's likely it begins a voluntary thing done by your big social media platforms, which circumvents someone saying it's their right to post a photo of you. People value their ability to disappear into the crowd, and in this case probably literally. When contemplating the zebra, one asks why it has stripes and folks say camouflage, and that's a head scratcher given that black and white vertical stripes wouldn't seem good camouflage in a prairie, but it is when you're part of a horde full of similar looking critters. Folks are a lot more concerned with their ability to hide in a crowd than preventing other people from being able to do so. This is probably why we don't already have cameras on every street and house, even though it would massively cut down on crime. We don't want other people being able to stalk us online and I'd anticipate laws shifting where needed to make that harder and harder. I would also bet human content screeners will be a continuing and expanding job area. Also folks able to hunt for the loopholes and cracks in automated systems to prevent others exploiting them. Another big boy then is that many people just won't have work, which is probably a legitimate concern, though some feel this will be 99% unemployment and 1% owning everything. This doesn't really seem likely. Again there's a constant effort involved in maintaining a system. Static operations are mostly illusionary, and even if we assumed 1% owned everything, including ultra-loyal robot enforcers, it is very hard to imagine that occurring or lasting long. Your mileage may vary on that and it would seem like a discussion that would be requiring its own video, and not one I feel much urge to write. Instead, I'm concerned about the bottom 10% getting unemployed, then maybe the bottom 11% and so on. I don't really see that going to 99 or 99.9 but even just going to 10% is pretty bad. There's a notion about some people just being too dumb to join the military, I've heard folks say no one lower than an IQ of 85 or 83, but I'm not personally aware of any official bottom limits or it being done off IQ scores rather than its own tests but that's the US military and it's presumably different in other countries. I've usually heard this in recent years associated with a remark by Jordan Peterson, who is Canadian so maybe that's their rule, or maybe the US changed it since I got out of the army years back. Anyway, it's accurate enough. Last I heard about a quarter of US high school graduates, and even more among dropouts, could not score high enough on the test, mental not physical, and thus get listed as Category 4, which are essentially the group that, in good recruiting times, are less than 1% of the recruits and those on waivers for perceived extenuating circumstances. And in bad recruiting times I've heard of it as high as 1 in 8. The lower those scores the less likely that person will get in and it seriously impacts efforts to keep them in or incentivize their joining with bonuses. That means something like a quarter of young adults are deemed not smart enough for military service of any sort, and the military is always short of volunteers so it's not like they're being snobby. I want to emphasize that because I often hear this example in the context of people who are essentially just too dumb to be trained to do anything useful for an organization, to the point that they'd rather do with fewer people than add those folks into the mix. I find that notion repellent but I can't say it's wrong either, I'm given to understand the data on it is pretty sturdy, and that there are folks who are just useless in any work capacity. I tend to feel it shows a lack of creativity in seeking work for those folks, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that there is a line where it's hard to find something productive for them to do that's not chewing up more of someone else's time to create or supervise, and that line is probably going to be drawn a lot more forgivingly in an automated society, but it is also a line that is likely to grow higher in a society growing more automated. At the same time, we don't want to overextend that military example. Modern militaries don't really need more brains because of all the technical roles and equipment, though it does certainly help, but rather because they're looking for folks who can make judgement calls and quick reactions as modern doctrine tends to emphasize small teams and making decisions, we don't line folks up for shield walls or volley fire. There is a genuine and at least semi-legitimate fear that folks who are not mentally and physically fit enough are exposing their comrades to increased danger. Of course a lot of companies and a lot of jobs require that same reasoning, and you also get fears of weak links being the ones who mess up cybersecurity, or get conned in more traditional ways, or don't understand the rules the company operates under and why and thus need to be inclined to memorize and follow them even when they don't make sense to them, to just follow orders. Needless to say that's something automation is good at too, 
and so it shifts things into asking if it benefits us to keep those folks busy productively, even if it has a modest or even negative effect on our overall production. To me the answer is almost always yes, because it's an ethical perspective as much as a practical one. I'm not a fan of idle hands and I'm not a fan of folks feeling worthless. I don't really like the notion of make work, to me it shows a lack of creativity, but if I had a kid in my household who couldn't seem to be trained to any chores besides dishwashing, but they used twice as much water, energy, and soap as my dishwashing machine, and broke more plates, I'd probably still have them do that. And the analogy to civilization as a whole is that we tend to believe it's better for something to be earned than given, or at least striven for. Your mileage may vary on that or on other perceived benefits to society. The counterargument would tend to be, instead of devoting more productive members of society to help those folks learn to do work they could do and supervising them, we could just let them do other work, tax it, and use it to provide a basic subsistence to provide for that person's comfort and care. And we do tend to mix and match these two, probably not as effectively as we could, but they represent your two major ways to deal with unemployment in a society where the entry skill level for work in demand is above that of which a large portion or even a majority of the population is capable. They are not the only two ways, and some are not palatable to an ethical person, I should think, but need mentioning anyway, that you either dispose of those not seen as valuable or just cast them out to the fringes. We won't contemplate those beyond that today beyond saying that there are also many logical and pragmatic reasons why those aren't great plans either, and we have a tragic number of historical cases of it being tried. Folks don't like when you kill their weaker family members while talking about the greater good, especially in a prosperous society, and casting them out tends to get you criminal elements, which cost blood and gold to manage too. Thankfully a highly automated society is prone to plenty, and so such arguments of desperation to kill off or cast out the weak to save the tribe are unlikely to find purchase. I would like to think we could find work for anyone which they both enjoyed and which benefited society, but even I'm not so optimistic as to assume that's guaranteed or that it would be particularly profitable and thus easy to get everyone to cooperate in creating. Also it might be that we would need to devote a lot of effort and resources to make that happen. Let's imagine for the moment that we could take 100 people who would otherwise be unemployed and with a little effort get them employed at something which genuinely pays their bills without subsidy by the state, but that we would need some full-time employees to do that. If it only takes one or two to achieve full and excellent matches for all 100, that is a great deal and makes for quite a profitable company based on finding folks a job. If it takes 10, well now it's going to be a bit more dubious how sound that is but it still makes sense. I think we start running into hurdles when it takes nearly as many, or even more than, to find them that walk. And it might get to be a bit like the rocket equation, where you get increasingly diminishing returns and ratio of fuel to speed. One might imagine 10% of the population walking main production, while half the remainder is focused on finding ideal and meaningful walk for the other half. Of course if everyone is living in mansions and in a sustainable fashion because productivity is just that high, this might still be fine. We need some caveats on this notion though that will slowly put more and more people out of work. First, helping folks find their dream job that they actually are well suited to is exactly the sort of data shuffling that artificial intelligence tends to excel at, so automating our efforts at employment might tend to cut down on how many people we need to throw at the task while improving results. Second, the basic needs of humans do not actually increase just because production does, that's a false equivalence. We have a slew of needs and generally we're barely scraping by, and while they are certainly our frivolous luxuries, a lot of things we classify that way are of the back in my day we didn't have X variety. Well we didn't have telephones, so someone who moved away to school or work or marriage couldn't call mom and dad when they needed advice or comfort. I'm not sure that makes it a luxury. There are many levels of survival and needs, and we should be seeking to address them all better. And third, that implies producing more things or more services, but that does not mean the basic level has increased. A society where a factory of a thousand people has been replaced with ten folks supervising the robots and monitoring the facility is one that, on average, produces 100 times as much as it did before. All things being equal, it means the farmer either tends 100 times the cropland or gets 100 times the produce from their cropland, or just that they now only need to spend a few hours a month running their small family farm. 
This is not one where people are starving in the streets without food, medicine, education, etc. It might be one where almost all these services are done by volunteering time to help, or by paying income and property taxes, or production taxes, or it might be that some individual's work is very low value, viewed as being less productive in a work week than the average person does in a work hour, but that normal hour would produce basic food and goods for one person anyway. I don't want to imply that each of these approaches is equal, I'd imagine one is better than others or way worse, but that's something I'd rather leave as food for thought. We also have to remember that many solutions have parts that peel or are disliked for reasons that might be separable. What is done privately by many groups of volunteers might make an approach okay to those who dislike the notion of big corporation or government doing it, while on the flip side many who don't like the idea of 1% of the population owning the vast majority of wealth often would be fine with government having control, or public ownership or partial share or stake. Many of the solutions might be more or less palatable to future generations for similar reasons of association. For my part, I think we'll see gradually more automation in different sectors and some slowdown as the available labor pool increases and de-incentivizes investing in more automation. You might even see a robot tax in some places used for training displaced workers, or subsidizing welfare or paying universal basic income or UBI, which in a productive enough society might only need 1% of the GDP to give everyone their basic needs stipend. We could even see something like a version of cryptocurrency that automatically distributed 1% of every transaction to every single person, or something along those lines, as a sort of combination of sales tax and non-governmental UBI. Those were just some of the strategies folks have suggested, and each has its advocates and detractors, usually with some well thought out reasoning, so my expectation would be that we would see various places try out each of those approaches and many more. I welcome everyone to discuss and suggest others in the comments on the episode or our show forums, though please do it with courtesy and thought, not jingo or shouts. My hunch then is that since this will all happen at different rates in different industries and places, we will see it as a fairly gradual thing, and I would argue it's something we've been experiencing for at least a century now. There are all risks, murderous AI and tyrants with robot armies being just two. But I think the key thing is that if we have more time not devoted to basic living, it is also time and attention we can turn toward handling those problems too. As crises go, greater automation is a better one to have than most, since it at least ensures you have an abundance of resources and minds free to come up with solutions and try them too. One of the upsides about a future where robots are doing most of the work is a lot more free time to catch up on everything you want to watch, listen, or read. Currently most of us have to get that in as time permits and that often means in a crowded or moving environment where it's really nice to have a quality pair of earbuds with noise isolation so you can hear your show, your audiobook, your music, or your phone calls. And if that's something you've ever had problems with, I'd recommend trying out Raycon's Everyday Earbuds. Their wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers offer premium sound, useful features, an almost custom comfortable fit, and up to 54 hours of battery life. Raycon's Everyday Earbuds have noise isolation and optimized gel tips for the perfect in-ear fit, so they are comfortable and they will not budge or fall out, they are water resistant, I've washed mine on accident before, and they give you high quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands. They're just all around great earbuds in terms of quality, versatility, comfort, and cost. And if you're looking for gifts, Raycons are the way to go, and their durability makes them great gifts not just for your adult friends and family, but for kids too. Everyone needs a pair of Raycons in their ears, whether it's for listening to music or podcasts like this show or taking walk calls. You know what everyone doesn't need? Two little white stems hanging out of their ears. Luckily Raycons are sleek and stylish and come in a range of colors to match anyone's style, You can find Raycons in stores now like Kohl's or Walmart, but let me tell you right now, you're always going to get the best deal when you use my special link, 
buyraycon.com slash Isaac Arthur. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash Isaac Arthur and use code EARLYBF to get 20% off site-wide, or save even bigger and get 30% off Raycon's exclusive holiday bundles. There will also be different deals coming throughout the season and I'll try to keep the description box updated with the latest offers, but just so you know, you can always go to buyraycon.com slash Isaac Arthur to get the best deals available on Raycon. So today we had a fairly serious and modern day topic, plus a major election earlier this week in the US, so I thought this weekend we'd go from that to our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Stranded on an Alien World. To lighten the mood and contemplate how to survive if we were left on one and we'll follow four stories of people stranded on everything from places much like Earth towards deader than the most barren desert. And two weeks from now we'll contemplate the exact opposite of a dead world, a world which was alive itself, as we discuss the Gaia Hypothesis Theory. Then we'll celebrate Thanksgiving with an episode on reasons to be optimistic about the future. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed today's episode and would like to help support future episodes, please visit our website IsaacArthur.net for ways to donate, or become a show patron over at Patreon. Those and other options like our awesome social media forums for discussing futuristic concepts can be found in the links in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.